Hi, welcome to Aviation Theory. In this video, we will talk about atmospheric pressure variations on Earth, both vertically with altitude and horizontally with distance. So, let's get started. In the previous video, we mentioned that atmospheric pressure varies both horizontally and vertically. A horizontal pressure variation refers to the fact that staying at the same level or altitude, if we move from one place to another, the atmospheric pressure changes. While on the other hand, a vertical pressure variation implies that if we climb or descend in the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure will change. Now. In addition to this, since the atmosphere is constantly moving and changing, even if we stand still at the same point, we will observe that the atmospheric pressure will change over time. But the question is, what do these pressure changes depend on? Well, let's start by analyzing the case of vertical pressure variation. As we already said in the previous video, atmospheric pressure depends on the weight of the column of air above the surface. Or in other words, it depends on how much air is above us. This way, if we are, for example, at sea level, we will have a large amount of air above us exerting pressure. Since, as we can see, the air column is quite high. To get an idea of how much this pressure can be, the atmospheric pressure at sea level is around 1,013 hectopascals. But if we start going up in the atmosphere, and we get to a higher altitude, we can see that there is now less air above us, which means that the atmospheric pressure here will be lower. Let's say around 850 hectopascals. So, in this order of ideas, if we go even higher, for example to the top of this mountain, there will be even less air above us, and therefore the pressure will be considerably reduced, obtaining values of around 500 hectopascals. So, in summary we can say that the higher the altitude, the lower the pressure. But the question now is, how fast does atmospheric pressure decrease with altitude? Well, to answer that, we have to look at the vertical pressure gradient, which is a parameter that basically measures the rate at which atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude. However, as we said in the video about the composition of the atmosphere, there is no defined boundary between the atmosphere and space, so for this example, we will assume that this boundary is 100 kilometers. So, with this in mind, and taking into account that the pressure at sea level is around 1000 hectopascals, one may think that if we climb up to the middle of the atmosphere, which in this case is 50 kilometers, then the pressure would be half of what we had at sea level around 500 hectopascals. This sounds logical since at this point, we would only be supporting half the weight of the atmosphere. But we have to say that this is just not true. This is because air is a compressible fluid, which means that most of it is concentrated in the lower levels of the atmosphere. This way, we would rather obtain a graph like this, where the pressure reduces a lot faster at low altitudes than at higher levels. This means, in other words, that pressure does not decrease at a constant rate, and therefore we can say that the vertical pressure gradient changes with altitude. For example, if we were to climb to an altitude of only 5.5 kilometers or 18,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure would drop by about a half, reaching values of around 500 hectopascals. And if we continue climbing up to 10 kilometers or 33,000 feet, then the pressure would be reduced to about one-third of that of sea level. Now, while it is true that the rate at which the pressure changes with altitude is variable, the truth is that at the lowest levels, typically below 10,000 feet, this rate is relatively constant. In fact, we can say that the pressure here is reduced by one inch of mercury per thousand feet, or one hectopascal per 30 feet. Now, this vertical pressure gradient not only varies with altitude, but also with air temperature. To understand this better, let's first look at a concept that is pretty useful to analyze the behavior of pressure, which are the isobars. This is a Greek term meaning equal pressure, and therefore these are lines joining points of equal pressure. So, with this in mind, let's look at how we can analyze the vertical pressure gradient using these isobars. Here we have the mean sea level, where the pressure is around 1013 hectopascals. This means that the 1013 isobar will be located right there. 
Now, if for example, at an altitude of 5,000 feet, we get a pressure of 850 hectopascals, then we can draw the 850 isobar at that level. And if we continue with this order of ideas, at 10,000 feet and 15,000 feet, we would find the 700 and 570 isobars, respectively. Now, it is important to bear in mind that these pressure values are found only under standard atmospheric conditions, since in practice, temperature variations can affect the position of these isobars. But you might be wondering, what does the position of these isobars have to do with the pressure gradient? Well, the spacing between isobars depends directly on the vertical pressure gradient. For example, if the isobars are closer together, then it means that the pressure changes rapidly with altitude, or in other words, we have a high vertical pressure gradient. On the other hand, if the isobars are widely spaced from each other, this means that the pressure changes slowly with altitude, and therefore we have a low vertical pressure gradient. It is important to note that the spacing of the isobars has nothing to do with the pressure at sea level. In fact, in both cases, the pressure at sea level remained constant at 1013 hectopascals. The only thing that changed was the rate at which the pressure decreased with altitude. So, you might ask, what does the spacing of the isobars depend on? Well, in most cases, the answer is air temperature. The thing is that air temperature affects air density, and therefore, it also affects the pressure distribution with altitude. In general terms, the higher the temperature, the lower the vertical pressure gradient, and vice versa. For example, under standard temperature conditions, at sea level, pressure is reduced by 1 hectopascal for every 27 feet, which would be the standard vertical pressure gradient. However, if the temperature is higher than standard, this will cause the air to expand and therefore have a lower density. This in turn causes the pressure to reduce more slowly with altitude. In this particular example, the pressure is now reduced by 1 hectopascal for every 35 feet. On the other hand, if the temperature is lower than standard, then the air will shrink and therefore will have a higher density. This in turn causes the pressure to change more rapidly with altitude. In this example, the pressure is now reduced by 1 hectopascal for every 20 feet. All this implies that the vertical spacing of the isobars depends on the air temperature. For this example, we will have a constant pressure at sea level of 1013 hectopascals. So, here we can see how the isobars would behave in a column of air under standard temperature conditions. Now, on the left, we can see how the same isobars would behave with a lower than standard temperature, where the pressure reduces more rapidly with altitude. And finally, on the right, we can see how those isobars would be arranged with a higher than standard temperature, where the pressure changes slowly with altitude. Now, something to note here is that the pressure at the bottom and at the top of all three columns is the same. However, the heights of the columns are different because of this difference in the pressure distribution. Actually, this is the reason why barometric altimeters suffer from temperature error, which we have already discussed in the videos about flight instruments. Now, so far, we have focused on how pressure changes with altitude. It's now time to see how pressure changes horizontally with distance. As we said before, atmospheric pressure can also vary from one place to another, even if they are at the same level or altitude. In this case, the same principle applies. In the areas where there is less air above the surface, there will be a lower pressure. While in the areas where there are more air molecules above the surface, the pressure will be higher. But you might be wondering, if these two columns have the same height, why don't they have the same amount of air? Well, the answer is once again, air density. In this case, the column of air on the right has a higher density than the one on the left, which results in different atmospheric pressure values at the surface. These density differences are mainly due to temperature variations and the movement of large air masses caused by global atmospheric circulation. But we will not go into detail on this subject in this video. For instance, let's look at what happens when there are horizontal pressure differences. Let's say there are three places that are at the same level, and in each of them we have a barometer to measure atmospheric pressure. So, at point A, let's say that we have a pressure of 960. 
At point B, we have a pressure of 10.05, and at point C, we have 10.40. With this, we can easily say that point A is an area of relatively low pressure, which is identified with the letter L, while the point C is an area of high pressure, identified with the letter H. So, in this situation, if we move from point C towards point A, even though we remain at the same level or altitude, we will experience a decrease in pressure. While if we move in the opposite way, we will see an increase in pressure. Now, the question is, how fast does the pressure change with distance? Well, in the same way, as we analyze the pressure change with altitude by means of the vertical pressure gradient, we can do exactly the same in this case, looking at the horizontal pressure gradient, which is basically the rate at which atmospheric pressure changes with distance. For example, let's say that in this case, point A has a pressure of 960 and point B a pressure of 1040. Now, it is evident that the pressure difference between these two places is 80 hectopascals, and let's say that the distance between them is 100 nautical miles. Well, with this information, we can easily determine the horizontal pressure gradient by dividing 80 by 100, thus obtaining a gradient of 0.8 hectopascals per nautical mile. Now, in this situation, if the distance between these points were shorter, let's say 50 nautical miles, then the horizontal pressure gradient would be twice as high, resulting in 1.6 hectopascals per nautical mile, which in the end means that the pressure changes more rapidly with distance. Now, the analysis of how pressure changes with distance at the surface is referred to as surface pressure analysis. In order to do it, atmospheric pressure data is collected in different locations to analyze the surface pressure behavior. For example, let's say we have this big island and we have different weather stations distributed at different locations, but at the same level. Now, Let's say that at 10 a.m. all these stations report their local atmospheric pressure simultaneously. Initially, we can identify two important places, the area with the lowest pressure and the area with the highest pressure. Now, what if to better analyze the pressure behavior, we join with a line the stations that are reporting exactly the same pressure. These lines by definition are isobars, but instead of being used to measure the vertical pressure gradient, we are now using them as reference for the horizontal pressure gradient. As we can see by drawing these isobars, we now have a much clearer idea of how the pressure behaves at the surface. In this other example, we can see exactly the same thing. Initially, it looks like a series of dots and numbers without much meaning. However, once we draw the isobars, we see that there are concrete pressure patterns on the surface. Now, just as we used isobars to, to analyze pressure vertically, we can also use them for the horizontal pressure gradient. Let's say, for example, that we have point A with a pressure of 960 and point B with a pressure of 1040. In between, we can see the isobars that determine how fast the pressure changes with distance. This way, if the isobars are widely spaced apart, then it means that there is a low horizontal pressure gradient, and therefore the pressure changes slowly with distance. While on the other hand, if the isobars are closer together, then it represents a higher horizontal pressure gradient, resulting in a more rapid pressure change with distance. Up to this point you might think, why is it important to analyze pressure in the first place? Well, pressure systems are complex and have a significant effect on atmospheric circulation and the weather phenomena that occur within it. Most meteorological phenomena have something to do with pressure behavior, but we'll talk about that in a future video. Before finishing, we must look at one last concept, the diurnal pressure variation. And is that in the same place, there tends to be cyclical variations of pressure in periods of 12 hours. These pressure changes show a relatively predictable pattern, with the highest pressure values found around 10 a.m. in the morning and at 10 p.m. in the evening, while the lowest pressure tends to be found around 4 a.m. in the morning and 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, it is important to mention that these diurnal pressure variations are usually maximum at the equator, where the difference between high and low pressure is around 3 hectopascals and they tend to be minimum at the poles, where the typical variation is around 0.3 hectopascals.
However, it is important to mention that the atmospheric pressure at a certain location not only depends on this daily barometric tide, but is also greatly influenced by the larger global scale pressure systems. I hope the information presented in this video was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below, it would help me a lot. Thanks for watching, and I see you next time.